This is the Strategic Hot Box Reel with Dr. Brandy Love Stankovic. Remixing your favorite episodes and moments and giving you the tools to achieve greatness. It's time to kick some ass. Today's topic, Generational Bridge. Hey, it's your girl, Dr. Brandy Stankovic. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for joining me in another episode. Today, we're going to talk about generations, how to lead millennials, recognizing villains in leadership, financial literacy. So welcome. Let's get started. So as you know, the hot box is broken up into three segments. We've got the learn, we've got the love, and we've got the kick ass. And that's how we like to do things around here. We learn a little, we love a little, and then we kick some ass. When it comes to millennials and young people and getting really the tools that we need to succeed, I want to bring in one of the the kind of leaders in this area. His name is Darren O'Reilly, and he is a millennial in Gen Z, which is going to be, or Gen Z, the next generation even beyond the millennials, thought leader. So talk to me, uh, what is your overall perspective about young leadership? Yeah, young leadership itself is a term that I, I'm a bit uneasy with. I think it shouldn't be a difference between young leadership, old leadership. Mm. Leadership is leadership. And I feel that many sometimes believe that years of experience make a great leader. But does time on earth alone actually make a leader noteworthy? And time has proven that a great leader is not defined by their age, but instead it's an individual's raw ability to inspire others to follow them towards a specific vision. So it could be a young person, an old person. I don't think young really matters. I know why we use the word young in terms of recognizing young people to bring along into leadership positions, but I don't think we should distinguish between young leaders and old leaders. A leader is an individual who can inspire action. And I think that's what makes a really good leader. I feel like you should just mic drop after that. (laughs) That was fantastic. I love it. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Heather Anderson. She is the co-founder and principal of Omni Channel Communications. Well, first we'll go with the boomers. The boomers were born in 1946 to 1964. Mm -hmm. So that was Gen X from 1965 to 1981. Oh, then I have to go Yeah, the millennials were 1982 to 2000. And and that's important because the term millennial comes from the year 2000, right? So 1982, um, that group graduated from high school in the year 2000 to those who were born in the year 2000. Mm -hmm. Um, And a lot of research um, underestimates the size of Gen X, and part of that is the confusion over when the generation starts and when it ends. I've seen some research that says Gen X only has 40 million or 45 mm-hmm. million members. I have no idea where they're getting this information. Um, I suspect they're only giving us about 10 years, and I, I've seen that. Um, that's not a generation, right. right? A generation grows up and has children. You usually need, you know. 18, 20 years in there. And so the way Pew divides it up does give all generations that adequate time. So let me formally introduce you now to our guest, Andy Janning. Hello. Hello. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. So how do we people, how do you, how do people recognize villains in their own leadership journey? Well, I think it's important to realize that hero, that villains are not necessarily the people that oppose us. Mm -hmm. We need to make a really clear distinction here. When we think about people who are villains, it's different from the folks that we just don't like or may say something to us that we that kind of gets under our skin. What classifies a villain, I'm going to kind of juxtapose it with a hero. A hero is somebody that looks at the world as something that they're here to serve and here to save. Villains look at the world as something here to serve them. Mm-hmm. Heroes have mentors. Villains have henchmen. The biggest distinction here is villains do not want to be held accountable. They don't want mentorship and they don't want to listen to any other voice out there. Mm -hmm. So when you have those things kind of working in tandem, that's going to create just this, this maelstrom of suck, if you will. And that's just (laughs) going to really just tear everybody's life up. And I love what you said in the open, that most of the times that that villain is us because we don't listen, we don't want to be held accountable and we don't want to find mentorship and we don't want to create more heroes in the world. That's Mm -hmm. what heroes do. Heroes are creating more heroes. Villains only want to create more followers. Heroes that create a community are creating something world-changing. Villains that only want to create more followers are creating a cult. And that's something that's a really clear distinction that I try to make. And I know that in my own journey, I have failed at that more than I have succeeded. But I know how deep the ditches are on either side of the hero's journey. 
And my job now is to help people avoid those ditches and kind of wave the flares and say, don't go there. There's nothing there but darkness. So I'd like to introduce you now to Chad Helmanak and Christopher Morris, who are officially the members of the Disclosures, the band, the Disclosures. So what does financial literacy mean to you? Brandy, you hit on a couple of really good points earlier when you were talking about financial education um, and the importance of it, especially with young people. Um, some people don't realize the amount of stress finance, uh, finances has on individuals and especially younger people. Mm -hmm. Upwards of 70% of uh, millennials um, indicate that money is one of the leading causes of stress they have. Right. And if you look from today versus about 40 years ago, you'll see that you know, a question often posed is, do kids have it tougher today than, you know, generations before? And when it comes to finances, in some cases they do. The cost of college versus the entry-level income, for example, um, yeah. it just simply costs more percentage-wise for people to do some things today than it did 40 years ago. So sure. the, the pressure's on to not come out of college, not, not turn 18 and get hit with these credit card offers and make mistakes because the pitfalls and, and the dangers in some of those decisions, and if you make them uh, the wrong ones uh, can be more devastating than ever before. Young people that are ages kind of 16 to 19, so the younger-ish of our millennials, uh, watch up to three hours of YouTube a day. And if you think about that, the whole world is kind of shifting in what exposure we have to social media, what exposure we have to technology, and how much that plays a role in what we do day to day. Let me give you an example of that. I work at a financial institution and uh, one of the people that is in operations, the chief operations officer was talking to me about cell phones on the teller line. So in a, in a bank or a credit union or any sort of financial uh, institution, you'll have like the front line, the people that you go do different transactions or interactions with. And with that in mind, um, they don't want the, the tellers to have their cell phones out or to be on them. And in fact, she was even making rules where they might be, have to be back in their lockers or back in the employee back room and that type of thing. And I said to her, you no, really, it's not about the fact that somebody wants to be on their cell phone. It's that that's the only means of communication. My husband, I mean, he knows that I'm here doing the podcast today. He knows that I'm in Southern Nevada, but where the studio is, you know, he probably doesn't because he doesn't need to, because if he needed me, he would call my cell phone, right? And so really it's gone way beyond the fact that cell phones are just a, a way to get a hold of somebody, but rather they're a part of people's lives. And so what do we need to do then uh, to inspire or get the best out of our millennials or young, the people that work with us? I think what we need to actually do, well, rather than what we need to do, what do they need to do? And with, particularly with millennials, they're often called the everybody gets a trophy generation. Mm -hmm. And as such a sense of entitlement is assumed on them. And rather than us telling them what they have to do, which is already kind of coming at it from the wrong angle, because if we have to tell them, they're, that means they either they're lazy or they're not motivated. They should want to do it themselves. So what can they do to kick their own ass? And they need yeah. to kick the ass of these stereotypes that are out there, that they're lazy Absolutely. or that they're self-entitled. So let their actions speak rather than letting words speak for them. Mm -hmm. Prove their worth and earn their place in society. And for, I suppose, millennials, it becomes an even greater issue when they're faced with trying to manage more mature staff. So instead of whining about not getting the respect as a young leader, they need to engage in some self-honest ass kicking. So mm -hmm. rather than us trying to kick their ass, they need to kick their own ass and the ass of these stereotypes and show their passion mm -hmm. and bridge the gap between young and old alike. And don't assume that title bestows that honor. Yes. Lead by example and earn your place. How do you think then, you've described this generation, why is it important to leadership? We were put in leadership positions as children. Mm. Uh, this generation is frequently called the latchkey kids. And there were some really important things that happened while we were children. And you alluded to that in the beginning is that there was a time of revolution. Um, in the 70s and 80s, women entered the workforce in unprecedented numbers, which is why, as a woman, I never felt limited as to you know, what my career might be. Um, also, the divorce rate doubled during the 60s and peaked in the early 80s. Um, it's important to remember, we, we think about that now and we go, yeah, well, that, you know, that happens today. But back then, it was new and there was no child care system in place. Mm -hmm. Nobody knew what to, what to do with the kids. You know, there, there wasn't um, after school programs. There was Boys and Girls Club and that was it. You didn't have that in your neighborhood. You know, there was nothing. So we went home by ourselves. 
and we we learned time management, right? We had to make our own snack, get our homework done, maybe take care of younger siblings. We were running the house. Mm -hmm. It was also a great time of self-actualization for parents. So it wasn't all about the kids. In the 50s, it was all about the kids. In the 70s and 80s, parents were discovering that, hey, I can be more than just a parent. I'm a person. My life isn't over. I want to date. I want to <laughs> change career. I want to go back to school. I want to do all these things. Um, and nobody really took care of us. Like we had right, to take yeah. care of ourselves. And, you know, boo-hoo, that's a, that's a sad story indeed. And it actually has resulted in some lingering emotional issues for Gen X that isn't present in, in other generations. But it made us amazing self-starters. You mentioned that 55% mm -hmm. of all startups are founded by Gen Xers. Mm -hmm. um, and it makes us great managers. We don't have to be told what to do. We don't be, have to be told how to structure our day we learned that in elementary school. Right. Yes. And can a, can a villain then be resurrected or does it require exorcism? I mean, what goes into that process? Uh, there is absolutely redemption for the, for the villain. And I've pointed to two major examples for that. Number one, you hear in, in, in virtually every movie that has a strong hero-based character, anything from Toy Story to the Marvel movies to Star Wars, mm -hmm. there is always this element of the hero trying to redeem and save the villain. He's not trying to go in there and just defeat him for defeating sake. He sees good in that villain, and he wants to help redeem them. The extent to which the villain listens to that, is willing to be open to that, and realizes that, hey, I'm broke and I'm busted and I need help— that's what helps turn the villain into a hero, a la Darth Vader. The <laughs> second example of that is actually from a huge project that I'm on right now that has nothing to do with speaking. Um, I am right now the official host and photographer for one of the largest Christian revivals going on in the country right now. I'm literally mm -hmm. going around to about 50 some odd cities around the country serving as the event host and the photographer for the evangelist and the hip hop artist and the tons of different people who are involved in this. I'm there to basically tell the story. Wow. What I'm doing afterwards, though, is, is this is what's the world changing part about it. The folks that come, they come into the meet and greet line to talk to the people that spoke and performed. And I hear hundreds of stories every week about folks that were the villain in their own journey, mm -hmm. that were objectively horrible, that were trying to not just oppose people, but ruin everybody else's life and theirs at the same time. Mm -hmm. Christ got a hold of them and they changed mm -hmm. in a minute, in a blink, and they're not perfect, but they see that redemption there. So that is what gives me faith right there. That's what shows me that, yes, anybody can change. Mm -hmm. You put the right influences in your life, anybody can find redemption. But one of the things that I've noticed is the younger generation is just a little less exposed and uh, to kind of the dangers of life and a little bit more comfortable. Now, mind you, not all people within this generation um, are, are part of this. Of course, it is a generalization about the generation. Uh, but this, but previous generations were abused in, in a certain sense, right? Whether it's like we can laugh about it from a parenting standpoint or we can laugh about it uh, from just what we had to do in order to get things done. I was having a conversation with somebody that did their dissertation in the 80s. And I'm like, the, fat, the thought of doing a dissertation, because I did mine in 2010, 11, um, the thought of doing that for your doctoral work at the library with like the Dewey Decimal System sounds crazy to me. And so that's just so much harder of an effort. So it, apply that to any part of life or business that things just used to be a little harder than they are now. And, but the downside of that is this access to information is really kind of making us a little kind of weaker in a sense. And what I mean by that is I don't need to know math because I have a calculator on my phone. I don't need to have this information in my brain because I can Google it or Hey Siri it in two seconds, right? And so that actually makes us a little bit worse off. So um, one of the ways to motivate and to ground us in some of those skills is to ask questions and, and not let technology be a crutch. So um, Chad, where have people applied this? So you've created these videos, you've made this music for people, you made it really easy to tie in and make mu and making learning about finances fun. How have people applied this and utilized it? Well, when we first started doing this and, and throughout creating the music, we always knew that uh, doing presentations and with the kids stuff we've gone into classrooms and done school assemblies and um, been able to introduce that music personally but beyond that um, credit unions especially have taken our music and done a lot of cool things with it they've um, used it for staff trainings for example and sharing that with members over social media um, they've used it for on hold music and um, even some of our other songs about credit unions in the industry and history and philosophy 
have been used um, for uh, advocacy purposes and educating the general public on what credit unions are and why they're important. So on hold um, music sounds awesome. I would love to be on hold somewhere and hear one of your jams for real though, because it's yeah. so much different and you're actually learning something along the way. Um, so what then motivates uh, that in, in your experience, what motivates younger people or what can they, we do to kind of take that next level? Yeah, I suppose uh, people in leadership positions sometimes are confused with millennials. They're like constant job hoppers. Mm. Um, so it is important to try and motivate them and retain good people in your organization. And one simple thing would be to just explain the company um, vision. You know, this sure. generation seeks out meaning and they seek out impact in the work. And simply punching the flock doesn't satisfy them. Mm. So by giving them the vision and helping them to understand how their role contributes to a larger plan, provides them with a sense of purpose and a feeling of value that motivates their productivity even further and makes them want to stay with the organization. So I think it's really important that that vision and, and the overall goal of the organization is, is clearly defined for them. Mm -hmm. it's the high performing leaders that are listening can probably relate to the fact that sometimes in the search of perfectionism, sometimes in the drive for results, mm -hmm. you lose some of that spirit right. of, look at what I've actually accomplished. Right, and that's a, one of my big, things that really calls to me is helping people fight burnout. Burnout's a very complicated, there are lots of moving parts in that phenomenon, but the biggest one is the sense of lack of personal achievement, of thinking that the work I do doesn't matter, that if I left tomorrow, no one would even care that I was even there. When you can show people, here's the net effect that you have, here's the dent in the universe that you made, and you should be proud of that. And when you have people showing, what, showing you what those are, they want to continue in that journey. That's what keeps the fire lit. When people don't think that, well, if I just checked out and I didn't really, if I, if I stopped doing what I'm doing, no one, no one would care. That's what, that's what destroys lives. So in this whole process and you learning about, I mean, obviously growing up within this generation, you relate to it and you know a tremendous about it now. What's been an unexpected learning for you? We, you know, as you get older, you reflect, you learn more about yourself. And one thing that Gen X falls short on is self-care, self-love. Mm. And it goes back to, you know, raising ourselves and being responsible all the time from a very young age. Um, we don't put a lot of time into ourselves. We don't give ourselves a lot of credit. Um, a lot of Gen Xers, don't talk about being Gen X, don't mm -hmm. think of themselves as being Gen X, which is very odd because the baby boomer generation mm -hmm. and the millennial generation mm -hmm. are so identified as such. So we need more pride, self-care, um, because we do kick ass yeah. and we need to own it. So, you know, as, as I mentioned, we've talked about millennials and, and millennials are making up uh, by 2020 will be 50% of the workforce. But what we don't often talk about in general is Generation X. Now, uh, as far as my kind of academic standards or things that I've looked up, say, it's the generation that was born between 1960 and 1980. Now, there are different books that say different things and Heather is going to give us, she's the expert, we'll let her kind of give us the final say in that, but 60 to 80. And right now, they're 34% of the workforce. So this is a big generation, and I know there's some misnomers when it comes to that. And I've heard a little bit about it in chatting with Heather, so I can't wait for her to dig in. But according to Forbes, 55% of startup founders are Gen Xers. So it's this generation that's out there kicking butt, that's moving into CEO positions, that are taking the C-suite as boomers retire, that are really managing a lot of people that are out there. And so often we forget to have conversations about how we can better capitalize, utilize, build on the strengths of this group. And really, if you think about it, this is a generation that was born in the time of change and unrest and technology was really starting to formulate and starting to come together and technology and how we know it now, I guess, or even the, the foundation of what was, you know, what we have now was built on. And a lot of Gen Xers want to be risk takers or tend to be a bit more numbers and risk takers and driven. And they are ones that create a lot of policy and procedures and really are, are setting up business of the future. The Council for Economic Education states that 72% of parents feel reluctant to talk to their kids about their money. 
72 percent. You know, I don't know the exact statistics when it comes to sex, but it feels like that's darn near close, if not more than what parents are, you know, when they're having the conversation about the birds and the bees. Come on already, parents. It's time. And, and I think a lot of that might stem from their own understanding of the things that they're going through as human beings in finance as well. 76 percent of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. So essentially just spending all that they make. And 47 percent couldn't come up with four hundred dollars, four hundred dollars in any sort of emergency situation or any situation like that. Now, tell me one emergency that costs less than four hundred dollars. I mean, really, like I think that it that these statistics are debilitating. It is really a, an issue that we're facing as human beings, as people in the fact that we really have to get people with the power and tools that they need. So um, share a bold action or a takeaway for the people listening. So I want everyone that's listening or watching this. I want them to think of somebody in their world right now that has done something specific and positive for them recently. Not just like, oh, think of the think of the best person, you know, but think of someone who has done specific and and a moment in time recognition or some sort of influence that they've had on them, something that they did or didn't do to help bless them specifically. And I want them to tell that person about that thing today. Yes, they have time. And yes, the other person needs to hear it. Mm -hmm. Going back to the thing about burnout, the reason that we burn out is that we don't think that what we do matters. Send this message today saying to them, hey, that thing you did last week, this really helped me earn more time or energy or money. This filled my cup. This kept my fire going. And I'm really excited about that. They send those messages and that creates connection. And mm-hmm. there's going to be any, there's going to be some special snowflake listening to this right now that says, oh, I can't do that. Yes, they have time. And yes, someone needs to hear it. Now, a caveat with that. If they have never sent those messages before, or it's been a long time since they've sent it to a specific person, be prepared for weirdness <laughs> because the person receiving it may go, what did you do? Right. Are you in jail? <laughs> and how much bail money do we need? <laughs> I've yet to find someone that sent those messages that didn't have the recipient say, Whoa. Mm-hmm. tell me more. Yeah. That's what creates strong marriages, strong relationships, strong work is when we're actually catching people doing things right. Mm-hmm. rather than trying to prosecute them for the per, for their perceived wrongs. Mm-hmm. But what's a takeaway that everybody can leave with and start implementing today? One I'd actually give as a takeaway, you've said I've given a lot of advice there. In life, you're going to get a lot of advice, and you can take it wholeheartedly. You can take elements of it. You might think I'm talking a lot of SH1T. That's your call. <laughs> but in life, everyone's willing to give you an opinion and advice. And the hardest thing is making your own decision and what's right for you and trying to Take that information, decipher it, and then make your own decision. And that's one of the biggest things I always struggle with. I was always a little bit indecisive in my life. And I had to learn to be a bit more decisive and be able to make decisions that are right for me. And sometimes you might do something in your career that people might not agree with. But at the end of the day, it's your life. You're only ever going to have today once. You're never going to have it again. So I think, you know, everyone's willing to have advice. The Internet's full of advice. Make your own decisions. Take, learn from people's experiences and mistakes but make up your own decisions and it's your life. So can you share a bold action item or takeaway for the people listening? Yes. If you are Gen X, like I said, own your greatness. You kick ass and you kick ass because you raised yourself. You know how to put your day together, time management. You're strong. You're emotionally strong. And if you have some lasting emotional damage, dare I say, from childhood, um, take care of it. Take care of yourself. And, you know, it's like that overused analogy of the uh, oxygen mask. You can't help others until you help yourself. So, so Chris, um, could you share an action item or, you know, a takeaway that anybody could start implementing or doing differently today? Well, I mean, I think the theme of the whole disclosures journey has been, you know, again, this is something we've always done outside our day job. So uh, I would say, you know, We've always believed that whole, you know, don't ask for permission, ask for forgiveness. Mm-hmm. I mean, certainly no one ever said, hey, you guys should go out and start a credit union ban or start a financial education ban. And uh, I think most of the stuff we did, we just said, you know, we believe in this. We know it's going to make an impact and we're just going to do it, whether it's a video, whether it's a song, whether whatever it is. And every time, you know, we believed in it and it worked and people saw it. And the response has been awesome because I think if we would have went and, you know, act, asked us 
the people that we needed to ask, hey, do you mind if we do a video on this particularly this particular advocacy issue or an important lobbying issue? They would have said, wait, you're a credit union man, you mm -hmm. want to do what? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But then when we do it, boom, it's across every you know trade association, every big credit union website yep. is using this video. So sometimes you just have to ask for forgiveness. Let's head out to the shout out. Hey y'all, my name is Jared Freeman. I'm the president and CEO of ASC Credit Union, and you're listening to Brandy Stankovic with the Strategic Hot Box. Hope you enjoy. Hi, you're listening to my granddaughter Brandy's Hot Box. She's special. I love her. Carl Mitchell, US Navy, World War II. Hello, Brandy. This is Mike Covert from Halong Bay, Vietnam. Good luck with the Strategic Hot Box. Woo! My name is Stephen Mullen. This is Boulder Dam Credit Union's financial literacy class. We are students of Boulder Dam's financial literacy class. You're listening to Brandy on the strategic hot box. Listen up! You're listening to my mommy on strategic hot box. Listen up, because she's smart and cool. If you ever want to send us a shout out, please do. And you can email us at podcast at strategichotbox.com or just head to the website and, uh, and submit it from there. So now it's your favorite time. My favorite time. It's time to kick some ass. Number one is to reflect on your story. I'd love everyone listening to think a little bit about where they are in their story. Th think about the, the roles that different people play. Think about where you are in your journey, who the villains are, your heroes, where you are in that process, when it is that you tap into those different roles, and how you can continue toward that success or toward your happily ever after. Number two is to remain nimble. You want to think on your feet, be able to be flexible, because this generation is one that will, will, will forever work with two to three to four generations. Gen X is coming in and worked with veterans and the ones above baby boomers. They're working with baby boomers. They're working with other Gen Xers, and they're working with millennials, and maybe even now working with this even younger generation that are starting to enter the workforce. And we'll have to continue to be nimble and be flexible with all the different styles that are out there. Number three is focus, limit distractions. We talked about technology and YouTube and social media and all those pieces. Focus your attention, know what you want to go after and go after it. Number four is to talk to someone. Don't keep this stuff inside. Talk to your kids about finance. You know, you should probably talk to them about sex too while you're at it. I mean, make it just a, a happy afternoon of, of finance and, <laughs> and sex. Um, but talk to your partner, talk to your spouse. There might be something that your spouse is struggling with, or if they don't know how to do the finances, or if you don't know how to do and handle some of the bills, make sure that you're equals in that place. One person may like control it in a different way. I mean, that depends on your relationship, but both people should be aware of what's happening. And number five is to mentor the next generation. It's time for us to mentor the millennials, mentor Gen Z, Gen Z, mentor even up, mentor those that are moving out that want to leave a legacy and for those that are in high level positions in your organizations now's the time to see how you can reach out branch out and mentor those around you those are your top five kick ass we'd love to hear from you on topics that you'd like us to tackle at the hot box so head on out to the strategic and give us some feedback you can also find us on twitter at brandy love that's b-r-a-n-d-i-l-u-v or on instagram at, at brandy love or at strategic hot box and you can email us podcast at strategic and if you want some ongoing access to some executive coaching tools some leadership development we have some worksheets out there on how to be a young leader or be kill it as a young leader, how to become a CEO, um, how to really just kick ass and we'll give you some ongoing, you know, instruction, ongoing energy, ongoing motivation, then head out to the hotbox.com and, and check that out. Um, we, we've built those tools to help jumpstart you and provide you that detox, that leadership detox that you may need. We've also got some pretty killer merchandise. Whoa! It's pretty exciting. Uh, Zach, I know this is super off the rim. This is a live show and this is happening, but Zach, run in here really fast and show your shirt. Come on, faster, faster, faster. Here comes Zach. He had no idea I was going to do this. He's got a hot box shirt on and I feel like you need one. And they say kick ass. They say hot box. All this really cool stuff. You asked for them and we put them out there for you. So until I see you again, get out there and have some self-love and, and kick some ass and do all the things that, that we want you to do. Be the best that you can be.